Here's a little known legend from my hometown in the Philippines. There's an infamous mountain here called Mount Cristobal. For tourists and people passing through, it's just like any other mountain you might see throughout my country. But we locals call it the Devil's Mountain for a reason. All sorts of peculiar and tragic happenings have occurred on and around Mount Cristobal, including the deaths and disappearances of many hikers and adventurers over the years. Some people claim that the Devil himself lives there, hence the mountain's ominous nickname, and most avoid going there like the plague. Us locals believe that supernatural creatures roam the area after sundown. The unsettling feeling one gets when approaching the mountain is enough to scare most people off, even those who have never heard of the mountain's reputation before. In fact, there are countless stories from would-be hikers who were overcome by an eerie sensation when they approached the mountain, and so decided not to climb it. Sadly, not everybody trusts their intuition. When I was a child, my father owned a gas station. I was hanging around with him while he worked one day, playing with some toys in the back room. That morning, a group of three tourists from America came in. They bought a few snacks and drinks, fueled up their vehicle, and asked my dad if he could help them with some directions. Sure, where'd you need to go? My dad inquired. The foot of Mount Cristobal, replied one of the young Americans. We want to check out the mountain, but we don't know the best place to start our hike. Do you know a good starting point? My dad's eyes widened, and his jaw tightened. He told them that it was a dangerous place, linked to numerous terrible incidents. Said that it was the devil's playground, a cursed mountain. The three of them laughed at him, unfazed by his concerns. That's why we came here in the first place. We want to check it out, chill with the devil for a while. I know now that most people from other countries think urban legends are all nonsense, and that the three Americans believe going to the mountain was just a bit of fun but my father took the stories about Mount Cristobal very seriously. I don't know the best place to start your hike, said my father. In my opinion, there is no best place to start. Not if you have any sense anyway. It's dangerous, I tell you. The group ignored my father's remarks, paid for their things, and drove off without any more discussion. I looked up at my father, and even though I was young, and this was many years ago, I remember the concern on his face as he watched those tourists leave. I asked him what was wrong, but he said nothing more about the matter. Five days later, news started circulating around town about what had happened. An American tourist had stumbled out of the forest surrounding Mount Cristobal. He was completely alone and delirious, having had no food or sleep for days. I instantly recognized his face in the local newspaper my father was reading. It was one of the Americans that had come to our gas station. The paper told his story. Apparently, he and his two friends found their way to the foot of the mountain after all, and began making their way up to the top. They'd brought a tent and supplies with them, and planned to spend a night atop the mountain. They set up camp near a cliff with a steep drop, and cooked themselves some dinner. At nightfall, the three of them sat in a row on the cliff's edge, their feet dangling over the side of it the kind of stupid thing young people do when they feel invincible. They sat there in the dark, looking out at the beautiful world that surrounded them. Soon, they realized something wasn't right. Hey, do you guys feel that? One of them said to the others. Collectively, they all sensed that there was something in the darkness below them. They stopped their chattering and peered down into the total blackness of the sheer drop under their feet. Without sound or warning, a pair of hands, attached to two long arms, shot up from below them, grabbed the middle tourist by his legs, and, in one fell tug, pulled him straight over the edge. They heard their friend scream as he fell, and vanished into the blackness, followed by a loud and distinctive thud as he hit the ground. One moment he was sitting there, then, in an instant, gone, swallowed by the darkness. The two remaining men scrambled from the cliff's edge. They couldn't believe what they'd just seen. Two impossibly long, stretched arms had just raised up out of nowhere and stolen their friend. They ran, and in their frantic escape, lost track of one another. One of the men kept running downhill, pushing through the brush and avoiding pitfalls. But as he made his way down the mountain slopes and came to a clearing, he found that he was somehow higher up on the mountain than where he'd started. 
he continued walking down the mountain, only to find himself somehow ascending it. For four days he wandered, trying to find his way to the bottom and back to civilization, all the while thinking he was losing his mind. Eventually, Mount Christabel loosened its grip on him. He emerged from the mountain and was given medical assistance. It was a miracle that he had survived. The man who was pulled over the ledge by the hands was found at the bottom of the cliff. His head cracked open like a coconut, his bones shattered. The second American was never found. To this day, it's unknown what happened to him. He remains unaccounted for, another lost adventurer claimed by the mountain. I tried to warn them, said my father as he read their story in the paper. I tried to warn them like so many others before, but you can't save everybody. Their story was read about and quickly forgotten by most locals. Like I said, deaths and disappearances are commonplace on that mountain. They were just another three men who went to meet the devil and got far more than they bargained for. One folkloric creature from my country that everyone knows of is the Balbal. Considered by many to be one of the most frightful and disgusting creatures in Filipino folklore, they're said to be an omen of death, but there aren't many who have a personal story to share about them. Most believe them to be fictional creatures too, but my uncle knows otherwise. He told me a story from his youth one evening, when the two of us were drinking alone and having a heart to heart, and I'm going to share that story with you now. My uncle wasn't one to lie about such matters, and he recalled this incident with such clarity and sincerity that I for one believe him, and I'm not the only one. In roughly his words, this is what he shared with me. I was only ten years old at the time. My father, your granddaddy, had suddenly and unexpectedly passed away. My brother, your father, was four years older than me, and very protective. After our dad passed, he effectively became the man of the house, despite only being a teenager himself. Took good care of mum and me, but there was something that he always got angry about, and that he refused to let me discuss. It was the day of our father's funeral. A crowd of family and friends were gathered around his open grave. We listened to the priest philosophize on death for a few minutes, and then watched as the coffin was lowered into the grave and covered with dirt. There were a lot of tears and condolences, the usual stuff. I remember thinking at the time, I should feel a lot sadder than this. I hadn't shed a single tear during the whole service, and I felt guilty about that. I loved my dad with all my heart, of course. He was a good man, a kind man. I'd spent the last few days in tears over his loss. But there was something about the atmosphere around that grave that felt off. It distracted me from my sadness. It's hard to put it into words, but the air had this sort of heaviness to it. There was a pressure to it that I hadn't felt before. Everyone's words seemed muffled, just slightly. No one else seemed to notice it, so I put it down to my emotions wreaking havoc on my body. As we all stood around, watching the hole be filled, I suddenly felt this strange compulsion. A compulsion to look towards the banana trees in the distance. I gazed at those banana trees. It felt like I was looking at a picture where everything else was out of focus except the part that your eye is supposed to be drawn to. Everything and everywhere else seemed a little blurry, but not this one particular section of trees. This was a weird sensation, and I tried not to panic, to fit in with all the other people around me standing silently around the grave, but I could feel a cold sweat forming on my forehead, and I couldn't look away from those trees. I just knew there was someone behind them, watching us. And then I saw him. A man with very pale skin, dressed in black. Not unusual for a funeral, but even from 50 or 60 meters away, I could tell there was something not right about this guy. Another person might have seen him and thought that he was just someone who knew my father, that he was watching from afar because he was shy or out of respect. Somehow, I just knew otherwise. After the service, the crowd dispersed, and my brother, mother, and I went back home, now one family member short. But I couldn't stop thinking about that strange experience, 
about the banana trees and the man hiding within them. I knew I had to go back and investigate, alone. I knew my brother would call me a dramatic fool, and after the day we had all just had, I didn't want to cause my mother any more distress. So, after dinner, I quietly left the house and walked quickly towards the nearby cemetery. The sun had already set, and I wanted to get back before my mother knew I was gone. There were no electric lights or anything like that at the time, of course, but by the time I reached the gates, my eyes had already adjusted to the darkness. As I made my way past the first few headstones and got deeper into the graveyard, that blurry, otherworldly sensation began to take a hold of me again. The closer I got to my father's grave, the stronger the effect became. I had to stop to collect myself. Standing still, I could hear a noise coming from around the corner ahead of me the corner that led to my father's resting place. My stomach was in knots as I stepped forward and turned the corner. There it was, father's grave. It had been dug up. His coffin was open, and there, standing over him, was the only thing in focus. A tall, pale figure, something between a man and a monster. It was shaped like a human, sure, but was much skinnier. The proportions were all off. It wasn't wearing clothes, and you could see each rib. Its face was buried deep in the coffin, but I must have let out a gasp because it quickly jolted up and looked right at me. Its eyes were dead, as if skin had grown over them, like a Greek statue. At the end of its stretched face was a grotesquely long tongue which thrashed back and forth. What must have been its mouth was stained with some dark liquid. I immediately knew what it was. A bal bal, the grave rubber from the stories. And just like in the stories, I knew why it was there at my father's grave and what it was doing with him in his open coffin. It was eating him, peeling his skin off with its tongue and bloody curved fingernails. I turned and ran for the gates, didn't stop running until I made it back home. I was in floods of tears, and my brother immediately told me to get a grip of myself and to not worry mother. He asked me what on earth was the matter, told me that he was the man of the house and that he'd take care of it, whatever it was. I confided in him what I'd just seen. He scolded me, told me not to make up such stories about our dearly departed father. Then, realizing that I genuinely was in a state of shock, He told me that he would go to the grave and take a look for himself. I begged him not to go, but he told me I was just in a state of grief and that he was just going to take a look to put my mind at ease. In the meantime, he said, I had to wait in my room. It was too late for me to be going back outside. Twenty minutes later, he returned. He knocked on my door, told me that he went to the cemetery and that there was nothing there, that there was nothing out of place at the grave and that everything was as it should be. Nothing out of the ordinary, and certainly no balbals out for a midnight feast. I had just been imagining things, he said. But I knew what I'd seen, and I told him that he must have just missed the thing. Your old man got real serious with me after that, told me to stop making up lies, and to never speak of this ridiculous balbal story again. He said, nobody likes a liar. You're gonna get a reputation if you go around saying you saw a balbal. But I wasn't lying. Maybe I was just seeing things, yeah. Maybe I did just have a moment of madness, sparked by the loss of our papa. A grieving mind can play all manner of strange tricks on a person, that I know. But it was so real, that I can't explain it. I just know I saw what I saw. I know it was a pal pal. I know it was watching us in its human form during the service. And I know it came to eat our dad. Anyway, I stopped talking about it after that. With that, my uncle took a swig from his drink. I didn't know what to make of his story, but I knew he wasn't lying. That's to say, I knew he truly believed he saw a Balbal, but maybe my uncle was just a bit crazier than I thought. Sometime after my uncle told me that story, I decided to speak to my father about it. I expected my dad to laugh about it. To say, that old story again, your uncle must have had too much to drink. Instead, he just looked at me with an uncharacteristically serious face. 
Your uncle and I haven't talked about that for a long time, he told me. I'm surprised he brought it up with you. It's a bad omen to mention it. My uncle had told me about my father's reaction at the time. How he'd told my father about the Balbal, -bal, and how my father had mocked him, and told him to show more respect to their father, and to stop lying about such drivel. The concern in my father's voice now caught me off guard, and I questioned him about it. There was a long pause. My father exhaled. I knew he wasn't lying. I saw it too. My dad explained that that night, when he went alone to investigate his brother's claim, he found their father's grave was covered, just as it should have been, but that it seemed freshly filled in, as if the dirt had just been placed minutes before. A scraping sound caught his attention, and he looked up towards some banana trees in the distance. There, he saw a pale, emaciated figure, with statue-like eyes and a thrashing tongue, dragging what was left of a suited corpse into the tree line. He then went home and pretended not to have seen anything. Firstly, to protect his brother, to make him think that he had just imagined the Balbal -bal and that the creature wasn't real. And secondly, so they didn't talk about it. That would have been inviting death into their lives. If you talk too much about the Balbal, -bal, he'll come for you. My father said that he'll never know for sure, but he's certain that if you were to dig up my grandfather's grave inside his coffin, he wouldn't find bones. Instead, he'd most likely find the trunk of a banana tree, the very item a Balbal -bal is said to replace a body with when it comes to steal one. For the sake of my uncle, I promised my father I wouldn't reveal his secret. The fact that they both had seen the same thing, and that it wasn't just my uncle's imagination. My father also made me promise, regardless of my own beliefs, that I never talk about the Balbal -bal with either of them again. This was all a long time ago, and both my uncle and father have since passed. I kept my promise, and didn't bring the story up with either of them again. Thankfully, I can say I didn't see anything at their funerals. No pale figure lurking in the tree line, nothing digging them up under cover of darkness. I don't know if I believe in the Balmal -Bal fully. I don't believe it's exactly how the stories say, that seeing it is an omen of death, or that talking about it will draw its attention to you. But I do believe that they both saw something at my grandfather's funeral. Something very few people ever have or will. And that such folklore stories exist for a reason. Because a select few know the truth and pass those stories on to the rest of us. My old high school was ancient, around 120 years old. It had had so many renovations in the past that its layout was a total mess. Even though it was a one-story building, it had a staircase that led up from one end of the corridor to the ceiling, and inaccessible doors embedded into the walls for reasons lost to time. The oddest of all of these incongruencies, though, was the watch cabin. From the outside, it looked like a normal country house. Inside was a sleeping area, big enough to fit eight tatami mats, an old-style telephone, and a small kitchen area. I never knew why it was known as the watch cabin, though, until the night of this incident. My home was far from my school, so I'd sometimes stay overnight at a friend's house who lived more locally. One day, though, I couldn't find anyone who could let me sleep over at their place, so I decided to spend the night in the disused watch cabin. Another person, a friend of mine, was going to stay there with me. We were in high spirits as we spread our futons on the floor, feeling like we were on a mini school field trip or something. We were talking and eating our dinner, when, unexpectedly, the old telephone started ringing. It made us both jump. Nobody was supposed to know we were here. I picked up the receiver. On the other end of the line was a school janitor. He was checking in on us. He said he was worried because we were staying at the watch cabin by ourselves. How he knew we were staying there was beyond us. Whichever janitor it was, he must have seen us sneak in or something. He told us not to mess around too much and so on. The usual spiel. Just as I was about to hang up the phone, he says, Oh, and one last thing. Make sure to close the curtains on the west side of the cabin. You got that? 
Without thinking too much, I said, sure, and hung up the old phone. When I thought about his words in more detail, however, they didn't make much sense to me. I didn't remember there being anything notable on the west side. What's he talking about? We asked each other, as my friend and I looked out the west side window. What we saw there was a sinister looking, old well, encircled by a hemp rope, like the kind you might see at a shrine. Up until that moment, neither of us had ever noticed it, because it was hidden away in a secluded spot, wedged in between the school building and the cabin. I felt a shiver run along my spine as soon as I laid eyes on it. I don't know what it is about that well, but it's kind of creepy, isn't it? I said to my friend. She agreed with me. We went to bed after rearranging our futons so they were side by side, making sure they were closer now than before, both of us feeling a little unsettled. I fell asleep quickly. I don't know how long I was asleep for, but I awoke with chills around my shoulders. I looked around and noticed my friend was missing. The cabin itself didn't have a toilet, so I assumed she had gone to the teacher's boarding house to do her business. I waited and waited, but she still hadn't returned. I opened the door and looked outside, but there was no sign of her. I felt uneasy as I went back inside. Without thinking, I opened the curtains on the west side of the cabin. There, outside, I could see my friend, standing in only her underwear beside the old well. Her hands were groped around her waist. It looked as though she was trying to pee. At first, I felt a little shocked, but then closed the curtains and tried to go back to sleep. Still, I felt that something was off about the way she was moving. I stood up, opened the curtains again, and looked out. I almost screamed when I realized what she was actually doing. She wasn't groping her waist. She was trying to tie a rope around it. I just watched on in complete disbelief. When she had finished tying the rope around her waist, she bent down and began tying the other end to a large stone by her feet. I became so scared I couldn't utter a single word, couldn't move. The next thing I saw was a pale, white hand come slithering out of the well. At first, the hand was moving as if it was searching for something and then stopped once it found the rope on the ground. My friend stood there with her head bent down, almost like she was in a trance, still and unresponsive. The white hand slowly began to tug on the rope, attempting to pull the stone into the well, to drag my friend down into it. I was paralyzed with fear. It was then that my ears were filled with a shrill ringing which pierced the silence. It was the old telephone. Immediately I came to my senses and felt my body become lighter. Before I knew it, I was out of the door and running for the well. I grabbed a hold of my zombified friend and dragged her back inside the cabin, shouting her name over and over. She soon regained her senses too and began sobbing heavily. Relief washed over me and I began sobbing with her. We both knew we needed help so I grabbed the old telephone and brought the receiver to my ear. There was no dial tone at all. The telephone wasn't working. We examined it, only to find that the telephone was only a shell. We hadn't noticed before, but there were no machine parts inside it, let alone a telephone line. By all accounts, it should have never worked in the first place. It was only at a later date that we heard the story surrounding that old well. When the school first opened, students kept ending their lives by throwing themselves down the well. The school tried to bury the well, but everyone who worked on burying it started perishing one after another. In the end, the school simply decided to give up on burying the well, and instead renovated the school building itself, extending it in a way that enclosed the well and made it more or less hidden. Still, occasionally, people would come and throw themselves down it. That's why they built the watch cabin. The school stationed a watchman inside to keep an eye on people, to make sure nobody ever went near that well. Thing is, in the end, 
even the watchman threw himself into it. Since that day, the watch cabin had remained empty. How did the telephone ring that night to warn us about closing the curtains? Better question, who was the man who I spoke to on the phone? I sometimes wonder if it was the old watchman, still standing guard after all those years. My friend John recently convinced me to share this story that happened to us near McCall, Idaho. We'd like to hear what you all make of it, cause it sure beats the hell out of us. John's parents owned a lakeside cabin, and we had decided to spend the weekend there with our other friend Tom. We just planned on kicking back with a few beers, going out and enjoying nature. This place was quite a ways out of town, pretty much in the middle of nowhere not another living person around for miles in any direction. We shed some laughs on our journey there, talking about all the things we were going to get up to. The place was a small but stunning log cabin, overlooking this picturesque little lake. We spent what was left of the daylight unpacking, cracking open cold ones, and swimming in that lake. We dived off the wooden dock into the water, cannonballing each other, and just generally having a fun time. Night time rolled around, and the three of us were playing cards inside the living room area of the cabin. It was a nice, peaceful evening, and we were starting to wind down after the long day. Now, it was a relatively quiet night, but at around 11pm, things became real silent. Any rustling outside had stopped along with the sound of the breeze and the hooting of birds. Out of nowhere, this eerie silence just filled the air. There was nothing suggesting danger, but we all looked at each other, like we all felt something strange in the atmosphere. It's hard to explain, but for a few seconds, the nothingness felt like something. Something horrible. That's when this loud splash broke the silence. It sounded like something huge had just fallen from a great height into the lake. We rushed outside to see what it was. That's the curious part. The water was completely still, no ripples whatsoever. But there was something there, something large floating in the lake. We got nearer to the water's edge to take a closer look. We could make it out now. It wasn't a thing. It was a person. A body floating face down in the water, arms outstretched. It looked like a man, and it seemed as if we were too late to help. The body was bloated, like a waterlogged corpse. Where the hell had he come from? Nobody else was meant to be around anywhere nearby. We all started freaking out, and John ran down to the wooden dock's walkway to try and pull the guy out. I fumbled for my phone to call for an ambulance. Tom looked on in horror as John got to the end of the walkway and kneeled down to grab the body as it floated by the dock. As I was on the phone, I heard John shriek. Something had spooked him real bad. Tom ran to his aid, but John came rushing back to intercept him, pale as a ghost. Guys, there's nothing we can do for him. He's gone. Come on, let's get back inside. Upon hearing this, Tom looked concerned. Dude, he said. We can't just leave him there. We have to get him out. Tom started moving towards the body. No, Tom, said John. Not you. Come on, back inside. Now. John's tone was so serious. I hadn't heard him speak like that in the longest time. It kind of frightened me to be honest, and it definitely convinced Tom, who turned back and hurried inside the cabin. We all waited in the living area for the ambulance to arrive, looking outside every now and then to see the body still floating face down in the water. The old red and blue lights took a long time to get to us, but as soon as they pulled up, we rushed out to greet them. We told them about the body in the lake and went to point it out to them. But that's the thing. It wasn't there. 
the corpse was nowhere to be seen. Where the hell had it gone? Had it sunk? Divers searched the small lake and found no trace of a body whatsoever. The water was empty. There were absolutely no tire tracks near the cabin. Nothing unusual or out of place. Nowhere for anyone to go. Where the hell had the corpse gone? The man had been face down in the water for ages. He wasn't exactly in any condition to just stand up and walk away. If this was some guy just messing with us, we had no idea how or why. This whole experience shook me up pretty bad, but I honestly wouldn't be sharing this story if it wasn't for what John told me. Remember that John shrieked? Well, he hadn't told us what scared him so much that night because he didn't want to freak Tom out. But, in private, John confessed to me what had happened. He said that as he leant down to examine the body, the corpse's head turned up to look at him. Its hand grabbed his arm. Its face was charred, its eyes milky white. It looked at me, bro, said John. It looked at me, and it said, why you, not Tom? John told me this with complete sincerity, and I for one believe him. We've never been back to that cabin since, and I think we'll keep it that way. I don't claim to be a saint, and some of my decisions in this story might make some of you think I did the wrong thing. But believe me, at the time, Self-preservation was my number one concern, and unless you find yourself in a similar situation, I don't think you can say you wouldn't make the same call as I did. With all that said, here's my story. I live in Missouri, in a small town far from any major cities. A short drive from my house is this really huge forest. A few years ago, I was out walking deep in those very woods clearing my head after a pretty messy breakup. I was in a bad place mentally, and by the time I came to my senses, I realized that I had wandered far off the beaten track. I was deep in the woods now. Damn it, I thought to myself. As I stumbled through the brush, to my surprise, I saw another person hunched down in a ditch. His back was turned to me. That was remarkably odd. This was an extremely secluded spot. Why was this guy so deep in the woods as well? And what on earth was he doing? Hiding? Spying on someone? I hesitated, unsure of whether or not I should approach him. I decided I would. Uh, hey, I said. I don't suppose you know the way back to- Jesus, shh! He cut me off. I clearly startled him. As he turned to face me, I could see that he was covered in mud and sweat. He looked terrified. In a quiet voice, I asked him if he was okay. He motioned for me to get down. As I edged closer to the guy, I could see that one of his lower legs was all bloody and injured. I asked him what the hell was going on. Little did I know the trouble I had just stumbled into. This poor guy had been out herping by himself when he stumbled upon some meth lab hidden deep in the forest. Some meth heads were inside cooking when they noticed him snooping around. Fearing that their operation was going to be busted, they came out with a couple of rifles and started firing at the guy. He ran through the forest with the men still chasing behind him, intent on killing him and probably burying him in an unmarked grave. He made it as far as he could when he noticed one of his legs was in immense pain. Because of all of the adrenaline, he hadn't realized that one of the shots had hit him in the leg. Now, no longer able to run, he found a spot to hide. The ditch. That's the situation I found myself in. I was now hiding in a ditch with this incapacitated man, with god knows how many armed meth heads out searching for him. I couldn't exactly leave the guy there, and even if I did, what if I bumped into one of the men searching for him? They'd probably just blow me away too. We didn't have any cell signal out there, so we were really between a rock and a hard place. 
We must have hid there for a good ten minutes together when we heard rustling up ahead of us. We couldn't see who was making the noise, but it definitely sounded like human footsteps to me. We remained silent. Thankfully, whoever it was passed by without noticing us. Another ten minutes must have passed. The tension was getting too much for us to bear. The guy tells me that he thinks the coast is clear and that he was going to hobble back the way he came. Said that he had a car about 20 minutes away. If we could get to it, we'd be able to escape, find cell signal, and call for help. I didn't feel comfortable with that plan. I just met this guy. For all I knew, he could have been anybody. Realistically, anyone could be chasing him for any number of reasons. I didn't want to get caught up in this mess. Not any more than I already was, that is. Not to mention, he was acting erratic and unreliable. I decided that I was going to go my own way, back the way I think I came. It was a quick decision I had to make, and I decided to go with my gut, and my gut told me not to completely trust this guy. We both checked that the area was still clear, gave each other a look of good luck, and then made off our separate ways. I turned and looked as he limped off. I hurtled through the brush, hoping I wouldn't bump into anybody. As I ran back in the direction I had come from, I heard something that almost froze me in my place. Two gunshots in quick succession, ringing out in the distance behind me. Then a third. I swallowed my fear and continued to run. I eventually found my way back onto a familiar path. It led me out of the woods, back to civilization, and back to cell signal. I called the police immediately. After combing those woods, the cops found the lab. It had recently been cooked in, but there were no signs of the meth heads anywhere. They never found the injured man. To this day, no bodies have ever been reported as found in those woods, so the optimist in me likes to think that those shots weren't aimed at the herper. The realist in me, however, thinks he's buried deep in those woods somewhere. I'll tell you this much though, I'm glad I went the other way. When I heard those shots, I knew I had made the right decision. Always follow your gut. My co-worker and I were driving through northern Arizona on Highway 89 between Flagstaff and Page. It was late, something like 2am. We had recently finished our late night shift. Up ahead on the lonely road, I noticed a set of glowing eyes in my headlights. Must be an animal up in the middle of the road. Not wanting to hit the critter, I let my foot off the gas and slowed down to go around it. As we came to pass it, I saw that it wasn't one animal at all. There were four or five, well, coyotes or dogs I guess, gathered around something in the road. But there was something wrong with all of them. They all looked up at us as we came up beside them, and their faces were contorted, morphed. Their features are not in the right place. The thing that they were huddled around in the road appeared to be another dead coyote, all bloody and crooked, like it had been hit by a car. As we drove off, my co-worker told me that one of the coyotes was following behind us. I looked in my mirror, and sure enough, one of them was chasing us off the shoulder of the road. As we gained speed, so did the coyote. I floored it and looked over. I swear to God. The bloody creature stood up on its hind legs and was keeping pace with our vehicle, looking more human than animal now. How it was moving so goddamn fast, I don't know. It was charging towards our vehicle. Luckily, as we picked up speed, we managed to outpace the thing. I could see in my mirror that it continued to chase behind us, becoming smaller and smaller in my vision before fading into the distance. We spent the rest of our journey back home trying to wrap our heads around what we had just seen. I dropped my co-worker off at his house, both of us just as confused as when the event had happened. 
That night, as I lay in bed, I heard strange noises coming from the woods outside my house. It almost sounded like coyotes, but not quite. Something was off about their cries. They sounded distorted and slower than natural. Their wails went on for a good long while. I refused to look outside my window, terrified that I'd never be able to unsee the image waiting for me. The wailing suddenly stopped. Then, quick footsteps approached my house. Whatever was in those woods was now outside my window. A human voice spoke. What's wrong? Nothing. Go to sleep. It was like two different voices coming from one source. It's hard to explain. These words repeated several times in exactly the same way, like a recording. As they did, a loud ringing filled my ears like tinnitus, getting louder and louder. It was becoming too much to bear. A few seconds and a heart attack later, the ringing and the voices abruptly stopped, and the normal silence of the Arizona countryside was all that filled the air. After all that noise, it sounded quieter than it ever had before. I heard nothing more that night. The scariest part, to me, was when I met up with my co-worker the next evening. I told him about the strange noises outside my house during the night. His face became ghostly pale. Dude, he said, I heard the same noises last night too. Several years later, I heard from a native gentleman about these creatures called skimwalkers. Creatures that can mimic the appearance and noises of other creatures that they've killed in the past, including humans. They usually can't imitate their victims perfectly though, and something about them almost always looks and sounds off. He also mentioned that they can only repeat the last words and screams of their prey, and that they'd use them to try and lure people into their midst. After hearing his description of these creatures, I remembered my experience years earlier. I couldn't help but wonder if those are what my co-worker and I encountered on Highway 89 that night. I told the native my story. Huh, you got lucky, he said. They usually don't leave people alone. <laughs> Not until they get them. I live on a farm in the Lone Star State, and I have some serious problems with my neighbour. He's a real pain in my behind, to say the least. We have somewhat of a rivalry, seeing how he's a farmer himself. I gotta say though, I'm grateful for that rivalry, and I'll tell you why. I'd been having some trouble with a few of my vehicles a while back. Someone had been slashing their tyres. Whoever had done this had also left manure in my mailbox a few weeks earlier, and put broken glass all over my driveway a couple of weeks after that. I was sure that my neighbour was responsible, but when I confronted him about it, he denied any involvement in any of the incidents. I was going to need evidence to prove that it was him. Then I could hit him where it really hurt, namely his wallet. Thus, I installed a few security cameras around my property small enough as not to be noticeable. My trap was set, now I just needed to wait for him to strike again. Perhaps a month passed by, and in all that time, there had been no new incidents on my farm. Maybe my neighbour had noticed me installing the cameras. Well, if that was the case, I was just glad it stopped him from coming onto my property, tampering with my vehicles, and pulling all sorts of horrible pranks if you want to call them that. One afternoon, I found myself driving alone back to my farm. I'd been out of town for the whole weekend visiting family. I was running a little low on fuel, so I stopped at a gas station along the way. I pumped in my gas and went inside the store to pay. Mustn't have been more than five minutes. I hopped back in my car and continued on my way, singing to myself and enjoying some alone time on the long journey back. A good 20 minutes passed, and by chance, I recognised someone walking along the road, heading in the direction of my farm. 
it was one of my farmhands, a young guy who had been working for me for a short while. He was carrying supplies back from town. Why was he walking instead of driving, I wondered. I pulled over and honked at him, motioning for him to get in with me. Sorry boss, he said. I woke up this morning, and you'll never guess what. The tires on the track have been slashed again. I was going to call you as soon as I got back to the farm. Oh, my neighbour, I suspected. I've got him this time. In a rage, I sped back to my farm, eager to look over my security footage and catch my neighbour in the act, to put a stop to this nonsense once and for all. We arrived back at the farm, rushed inside to the computer, and loaded up that day's footage. There, on CCTV, was a masked figure sneaking onto my property and slashing my tyres. It was my neighbour, for sure. His same build, his same scraggly hair hanging out the back of the mask. I was furious, and immediately called the police. Oh, this was juicy. I had finally caught him red-handed. My farmhand and I checked through the rest of the day's footage, seeing if he'd been up to anything else. Nothing else seemed out of the ordinary. We got to the part where we had just pulled up into the driveway. That's when the footage displayed something that took a while to fully sink in. The footage showed what we expected. In it, you could see my farmhand and I pull into the driveway, get out of the car and rush into the house. Nothing else happened for a few moments. The car just sat there, parked outside the house. Then, the back door slowly opened. Somebody had been hiding in the back seat of my car. A man I had never seen before in my life carefully exited the vehicle, looking towards the house as if to check if he'd been seen. He then sprinted off my property. I immediately grabbed a rifle and headed outside. I checked the back seat of my car. Nobody else there, thank God. But there was something that made my gut sink. Stabbed into one of the cloth seats was a hunting knife. The cops reviewed the footage and took the matter seriously. They later let me know that they had reviewed the footage from the gas station I had stopped at as well. They told me that while I was inside paying for my gas, some wacko snuck inside the back seat of my car. He'd been lying down the whole journey back to the farm, hiding mere inches behind me. Why he targeted me and what he planned on doing, I can't say, but nothing else ever came of it. In a way, I'm glad my neighbour caused me so many problems. If it wasn't for him, I'd never have installed those cameras. Nor would I have passed my farmhand on the way back to the farm. I'm guessing that if my farmhand hadn't been in the car with me, things would have ended very differently. I have thalassophobia. This is defined as an intense and persistent fear of the sea, or of sea travel. It can also include the fear of being in large bodies of water, fear of the vast emptiness of the sea, of sea waves, and of distance from land. Most people find this odd, considering I grew up on an island in the Pacific Northwest. My relationship with the ocean is one of love and hate. I find it beautiful and mysterious and terrifying all at the same time. I can ride a ferry or a boat like riding in a car, and I can even swim in the shallows. It's what's beyond there that scares me. This experience is responsible for that fear. I was ten years old. My grandparents lived right on the beach where the ferry docks. When I say right on the beach, I mean there was only a 20 foot long yard and a stone bulkhead separating their home from the shore. I grew up digging for clams when the tide was low, building forts from driftwood and swimming in the freezing cold waters of Puget Sound. I had no fear of the sea. I guess it also helped that my parents' home was close to the ocean too. This particular morning, my grandfather had recruited me to help him repair one of the crab pots that he had set up the previous week. It was early, and there was a layer of fog covering the water. 
I hopped in the small boat and buckled my life jacket as my grandfather pushed us out into the sea. I let my fingers slide across the top of the water as we moved farther and farther out. The sea became darker and darker. Soon I could no longer see the bottom. We stopped at the bright orange and red buoys that marked our pots. While my grandpa pulled up the broken one, I stared over the side of our small boat. I could see a small school of fish swimming just below the surface. My grandpa asked me for some pliers. I reached down into the bag of tools in front of me and pulled out a pair. As I handed them to my grandpa, I looked over the edge of the boat again. The school of fish had scattered quickly. I looked closer into the darkness and saw two eyes staring back at me. I knew what fish eyes looked like, and these were not the eyes of a fish. They looked human. They were large and wide, and they were coming closer, rising from the depths of the water. They were wild and horrible. I jerked back, causing the boat to rock. My grandpa grabbed the back of my life jacket to stop me from falling over the edge. Whoa, kiddo. What's got you spooked? I pointed into the water and just said, Eyes. My grandpa looked at me quizzically and then peered over the side of the boat where I'd been. Now, my grandpa was an Irish World War II veteran, a former boxer who was covered in tattoos. Not a lot rattled the guy. When he looked back at me, I saw the distress on his weathered face. Without a word, he threw the crab pot he had been working on back in the water. Jules, don't look into the water, okay? And keep your hands in your lap. The tone of his voice was low and serious, but I could tell by the way he called me by my nickname he was trying to keep me calm. I was the baby of the family, and my grandpa had always been fiercely protective of me. He rode back to shore faster than I thought a 76-year-old man could. Of course... My curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced into that dark water. About a foot below the surface, I saw what looked like black hair, floating, moving through the water. I yelped and felt tears rolling down my cheeks. When the boat hit the rocky sand, my grandpa jumped out and pulled the boat out of the water. I was too scared to move. My grandpa picked me up and carried me up the stone steps to the yard. He didn't set me down until we walked through the front door. My grandma was standing in the living room with a concerned look on her face. Sweet Jesus, Richard. What's wrong? You're as white as a sheet. He set me down and knelt down next to me. Go in your grandma's room and watch TV, okay? He said to me, ruffling my hair and wiping a tear from my cheek. I ran into her bedroom and jumped on her big bed where their black cat, Dynamite, was sleeping. I cuddled up next to him as he purred. I strained my ears to listen to my grandparents going back and forth in the living room. Barbara, they were human eyes, like some goddamn banshee rising up from the depths of hell. Scared the kid half to death. My grandmother didn't say anything. I'm not taking the kids out on that boat. Not anymore. I tried to focus on the TV. I tried not to think about those eyes. What that thing could have possibly been. I had nightmares for weeks after that. As I got older, the memory seemed to fade. It still lurked in the back of my mind, but not as strongly as it did before. I often wondered if I had really seen it at all. If, in my adolescence, I had let my imagination get away from me. When I was a junior in high school, my grandfather passed away. Before he did, I remember sitting in the living room with him. He rocked back and forth in his old chair as he carved the hunk of wood in his hand. Hey, do you remember that time that we went out to fix the crab pot and we saw that thing in the water? I asked him. I half expected him to look at me like I was crazy. But he didn't. He stopped rocking. He didn't look up from his carving, but I could see his facial expression change. Yeah, but there was something I didn't tell you at the time. You were too young, and I didn't want to spook you any more than you already were. 
when I was pulling the boat in, I saw a head poking out the water, just the top. It was covered in black hair, and those eyes were staring right at me. That's why I picked you up out of the boat and carried you. I didn't want to chance that thing, snatching you. I sat there in disbelief. Even at 83, and having survived two heart attacks and a stroke, this still shook him to the core. Not too long after this conversation, my grandfather passed away. As I said in the beginning of the story, I have a love-hate relationship with the ocean. It's beautiful and mysterious, but I'm sure that in its depths harbor dark things we cannot even begin to fathom. Whenever I ride the ferry, which is often, I find myself staring into the inky abyss of the sound and expect to see those eyes staring back. There are a lot of crazy stories from Florida, but I think my experience has to be considered one of the weirdest. It took place two years ago on a woody trail in Lee County, and I swear it's a hundred percent true. My girlfriend and I were driving home one night, and at one point or other must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. We were coming home from a weekend break, and were taking an unfamiliar route back. It was dark, and our GPS wasn't working right on the country roads. We were both getting pretty frustrated, when, by chance, we saw another car parked up ahead of us in the distance. All the doors of the vehicle opened, and four figures stepped out. Perfect, we thought. Maybe they can help us. I rolled down the driver's side window, and slowly drove up to where they were. I called out to them, asking for directions. We must have only been about 20 feet away from them, and noticed that they were all standing with their backs to us. They were frozen still, completely motionless. Hey, uh, are you guys okay? I asked. No response. I drove up right next to their car, and again, I asked, well, are you okay? In total unison, they all turned their heads to look at me. And when I say their heads, I mean only their heads. Some of them twisted their heads so much they were on backwards. The rest of their bodies remained perfectly still. But the worst part was their faces. When I saw them, I swear I felt like I was going to faint. They were pale white and completely featureless, like store mannequins or crash test dummies. The one closest to our car started shaking its head, no. Its head was moving very fast and jerky, and only became faster and faster. They all turned their bodies to face us, and started slowly moving towards our car, their movements stiff and awkward. We didn't stick around to see any more. My girlfriend yelled drive, and believe me, I did. I looked back as we drove off and they were all standing still again, except for the one that kept shaking its head real fast. Had I been the only one to have experienced this, I would have thought I was going crazy. Hell, everyone I've told has called me nuts. But my girlfriend can back me up, and neither of us will ever forget what we saw in those woods that night. Is there anyone else out there that's encountered something similar? We can't be the only ones. I live in a small town that sits alongside Bayou Tesh, a huge body of water that stretches on for 125 miles in the heart of Cajun country. Where we're from, there's a little known urban legend. Only folks who live around the bayou seem to know about it, and even then, only in certain circles. I only came to learn about it after I had an encounter with this thing myself. I'll get straight to it. I was out walking with a couple of friends of mine a few years back, one of those boring summer afternoons where you don't have anything to do but wander around aimlessly. Out of nowhere, all the sounds around me stopped. All I could hear was an eerie, loud breathing filling the air. It wasn't my breathing, nor the breathing of my friends. It was coming from elsewhere, but it was loud, and it was prominent 
and it was literally the only thing I could hear. Do you guys hear that? I asked my friends. Well, I think I asked. I could feel the words escape my mouth, come out of my throat, but I couldn't hear them. I couldn't hear what my friends were saying back to me either. Their lips were moving, but all I could hear was that damn breathing. No birds, or rustling, or footsteps, or any other natural sounds at all. It was surreal. Hold up, I said, and tried to say, and motioned for my friends to wait for me. I then moved towards where I thought the breathing was coming from, behind a few trees next to the bayou. As I got closer, the sound of the breathing became louder and louder. I knew what curiosity did to the cat, but nonetheless, I followed that damn breathing to its source. It's hard to explain why. I just felt compelled to. It was like a magnet, drawing me in. The weird part was the different sound of each breath. They were more like gasps, if that makes sense. Like the person was struggling to breathe. They were all different from each other too, as if every breath was coming from a different set of lungs. I continued on to where I thought it was coming from. I came to a break in the foliage. There, thirty feet ahead of me, sitting on the edge of the bayou, was a man. He was wearing a western-style hat and a brown leather jacket. That's about all I could make out, seeing how his back was turned to me as he looked out across the muddy water. He was completely motionless, like he was really focused on something, but there was no doubt in my mind that the breathing was coming from him. Despite the weirdness of the situation, he didn't seem scary to me. I felt calm and serene. For whatever reason, I thought about approaching him. I managed to shake that thought out of my head, and instead called out a soundless, Hey! Only the man's head moved. It slowly turned around to face me. His skin was the same shade as the leather of his jacket, and he looked to be half decayed. He had no lips, no eyes, just exposed teeth and two huge black holes. After staring at me for a few seconds, the man began to stand up. All sounds came back to me in that instant. As I looked into those dark pits in his face, my sense of calm disappeared. Now all I was filled with was dread. I bolted and ran back to my friends, told them we needed to leave immediately, and explained everything on the way. Most of them told me I was crazy, but one of them told me to come and talk with his grandparents. You see, the folks whose family have lived around Bayou Tesh for generations, they know about the man. I've heard several names floating around for him. Swamp Man, the Cajun Devil, but most just call him the Bayou Man. They say he's like a siren, that he travels around the circumference of Bayou Tesh on a continuous loop, and draws people away from their friends and families, brings them out to him. Then he lures them to the water's edge and holds them under the muddy water until they expire, leaves them at the bottom of the bayou for the gators. His weird breathing, they say it's made up of the final gasps of each of the people he's ended. You can sleep tight now, they all tell me. The bayou man will only try to get you one time. You got lucky. I guess I did. I'm glad I didn't fall for his trick. In my late teens, I used to take part in competitive snowboarding. One of my competitions brought me to Snowshoe Mountain in West Virginia. While I was there, I couldn't shake this weird feeling. I chalked it up merely to pre-competition excitement, to the constant grey skies, and the fact that I had to cross two state lines to get here with my mum driving me. I made friends with some of the other competitors, one guy in particular. He and I both practiced the course together from time to time. It soon became quite apparent that not all of these courses were as well maintained as they ought to be. Watch out for that one kicker, I was told. It's dangerous. For reference, a kicker is a type of jump in a sense. While normal jumps are wedge-shaped and shoot the snowboarder upward, a kicker is more curved and launches you forward. 
they can be dangerous, because if you hit them wrong, you're basically throwing yourself headlong in any direction but the way you want to go, and there's little you can do to recover at that point when you're speeding down the slope at roughly 25 miles an hour. None of us wanted to hit that kicker very hard. There were too many trees around for our liking. The thing is, with this competition guaranteeing the winners a spot in the nationals, many of us were itching for as many points as we could get. The day of the competition came. It was a weird day. Grey clouds. Everything felt heavy and off. I took my run among the first. I made it down the mountain, making decent time. On the way back up, I saw it. Those iconic red jackets, and a long stretcher covered up. Instantly, I knew. My buddy had gone hard on that kicker, after all. The officials tried to play it calm, but there's no coming back from a broken neck. A dark mood hung over us all. It was getting late, and my mum was ready to go home. Frankly, so was I. As soon as I got my awards, my mum hurried me into the car, and I managed to slip into the driver's seat, still in my gear. The drive back home was going to be a long one. It led us down winding, ill-lit back roads all the way through the mountains. The clouds from that morning never went away, covering the stars. Nor did that weird feeling. I was tired, sore, and the thought of my new buddy, now deceased, hung in the back of my mind. I just wanted to get away from there. After driving for a while, I started to bake inside my heavy snowboarding gear. I told my mum I needed to pull over and take some layers off. It was very dark, and the only traffic on this road, other than us, were a few semi-trucks. Thick wooded slopes and mountain rock faces lined the highway. No off-ramps till we got down from the mountain. Up ahead, I saw a small, curved dirt turnoff, barely the length of three cars. I quickly pulled in towards it. As the car eased to a stop, I noticed something in the dim reach of my headlights. A large, painted boulder, with something sitting on it. Reaching for the car door, I strained my eyes to see what it was. It looked like a large, weird-shaped, upright log with thick branches. What is that? I wondered. Suddenly, my mum started to hit my arm. Get us out of here, she ordered frantically. What? What is it? I demanded, still trying to make out the shape. Drive! She shouted. I could feel the weight of her hand hitting me through all my thick layers. Then, my tired eyes focused, and I could make out what was on the rock. It wasn't a log. It was a severed deer's head. It was perched upright on the rock, its cloudy eyes shining in the headlights, its tongue hanging out. Red oozing down the side of the boulder, staining it a dark colour. My heart started pounding in my chest. I looked around, and noticed there were no other cars or trucks in the small pocket. There was room, really, for only one or two cars. Drive, my mum shouted again. I had to wait for a large semi to pass by first, before pulling back out onto the main road. All the while, that thing was staring at me. It was only a few minutes, but it felt like an eternity. I could barely think between my mum shouting and the flood of panic squeezing my chest. As soon as that truck passed, I peeled back onto the highway. Where did that thing come from? Who put it there? And more importantly, why? There were no other people in the area that I could see, and no way for someone to park a truck or car. Was it some sick prank? Was there something waiting in the trees just out of sight? Was it really some sort of trap meant to throw us off? Or was it just some sort of omen related to my now gone buddy? I have no idea, and I really don't want to know. But yeah, that's my story. Just be careful if you find yourself driving through the mountains of West Virginia. Always be aware, and don't take chances unless you have to. We made it down the mountain okay, and I've been back to snowshoe since then. Thankfully, I've never come across anything like that again.
It was just a weird day, I guess. A very dark, weird day. During the midsummer, usually around the middle of July, me and a few of my good friends, Ryan, Kevin, and Tommy, always made time to go up to Kev's family cabin, located on Vermilion Lake, way up north in the forests of Minnesota. Throughout all of our young years, we would always be accompanied by Kevin's dad, and sometimes a few of our dads as well. Once we were juniors in high school, however, we felt mature enough to go to the cabin on our own, finally without Kevin's dad or any other adult supervision. My friend's cabin was very remote and very little, based upon a large island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was a solid half mile away at least, and you could only get to it by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the island, and take his boat across the lake about a half mile. Vermilion Lake is huge. My mind always had a tendency to run around while I was sleeping there. The cabin was all on one level, with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen and living room area connected to them, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. And there was always one window in each of the rooms with no curtains to them at all, so it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. And this is where my mind would run, as I always thought about someone peering in. And they never were, of course. I had been to the cabin about a dozen times during my lifespan, and nothing bad ever happened there. So the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now for the event. On this particular trip, we planned to stay around five nights. On the third night during the trip, when we were finally on our own, we had set up a campfire and had been drinking beers all night. I don't condone underage drinking, but being the rebels we were, we just so happened to sneak some. We went out to the dock to stare up at the magnificent stars and enjoy our buzz, when all of a sudden, we heard something out on the water that sounded like a fish jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked over at the lake, wondering where the splash came from, our fishing poles at the ready. Thankfully, the moon was out that night, which lit up the lake. Without it, it would have been pitch black, what with there being no city lights for miles upon miles. Ryan began to point out to something. Um, guys, what the hell's that? After looking closely, and finally spotting what he was pointing at, the only way I can describe it is it simply looked like a head floating out in the middle of the lake, staring at us directly. It was about three quarters worth of a football field out in the lake from the dock. It had long, black hair, and a very pale, skin-like face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, mouth, nose, or chin as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget that feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck and arms all stood up, and I felt paralysed on the inside and ready to go home at that moment. We told ourselves it was just a loon. Those birds are very popular night drifters on the lake, and they do their hunting late. I mean, it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting for a bit. Or at least, we tried to convince ourselves of that scenario. All of us had the creeps. That damn thing wasn't moving one bit, just treading water in the same place. We went back to our campfire, lit it even brighter, and headed inside to drink more. We soon forgot about the head-like thing with the help of the beer. That is, until I had to use the bathroom really bad, and the one inside was preoccupied. I went outside to do my business seeing how we were in the great outdoors. Whilst taking a pee and glancing at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black, circular object was still there, but about thirty yards closer now, still looking as if it was staring right up at me. I could easily see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale, like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me and I immediately went back inside and told my friends to come and look. They all came outside to see it still there, looking at us as if the head was corked up and its chin was in the air. Nobody dared go down to the dock anymore, and we immediately went back inside, deciding it probably wasn't a loon. For a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. 
This head-like object was stiff as a board, and not moving a single muscle, just staring up at us from the deck. And there was no ripple effect from it at all. We said it was just a log, and went back inside. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy, too. A few hours passed. It was super late into the night at this point, and we all knew we needed sleep. Being my curious self, I looked back outside one last time, and the black object had completely vanished. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief, thinking the log must have floated off, or just hit shore somewhere else. There was no AC in the cabin, and we had to open the windows, or else we'd fry in the middle of summer. Me and Tommy slept in the living room, while my two other friends slept in the two bedrooms with their doors open. Not being able to sleep, but keeping my eyes shut, I began to hear someone walking around outside, at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. No question that whoever or whatever I heard down there was on the deck, pacing back and forth, their feet clicking on the wood. It was as if they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. I wanted to whisper to my buddy, but was frozen in fear. I just kept my eyes shut, and my ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two rapid steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and sounded like they were sprinting away down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke up Tommy and asked him if he'd heard the steps. We both sat up and were startled by Ryan walking out of his room and saying, We need to leave. Now. There was something very disturbing about his expression. I asked him why. He woke up Kevin in the other room. Come on, get to the boat. It's time to go. What? Ryan, what the hell's wrong with you? Kevin asked. Ryan explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff. I'll never forget what he told us. Nor will my other friends. He said that when he was turning sides on his bed to get more comfortable, he saw someone peeking in at the top right corner of the window. The figure quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, ghostly white skin, and long black hair down the window. When looking back at what he experienced, it chills us to the bone to realize that since this face was in the top right corner of the window in my friend's room, it was either damn near eight foot tall, standing on something like bricks trying to peek in, or was floating. Tommy and I told the others what we had heard outside the cabin, absolutely disturbed the hell out of our minds and feeling like we were going to be sick. We all packed up our stuff and booked it, not cleaning the cabin or anything. We locked up, and as we headed down the stairs, we saw bare footprints in the dirt, heading off along the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace, made it to the boat, not knowing what was watching us or around us, threw our stuff in the boat, untied it, and sped off. I didn't even think about the head in the water. My eyes were just glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving. I saw nothing. When we finally got our stuff packed in the car, we hopped inside and took off. We drove for about ten miles, when, out of the blue, Ryan all of a sudden broke down in the car sobbing, saying things like, What was it, guys? What was it? Oh god, what did I see? We called to tell our parents what had happened on the way back, told them that Ryan was freaking out. They said to just get home safely and quickly. It was late, about four or five in the morning, but no one slept. It was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend. Said he didn't experience anything weird while there, but did mention that the bare footprints were still lingering about. That bugged him badly. What Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping for multiple nights, and ended up having to seek help for a couple of weeks and hop on some sleeping medicine. As time went on, he ended up being fine but isn't too comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain. To this day, I can't explain what happened, nor why it seemed to happen to us. Nothing has ever happened at that cabin since that night, so we're told by Kevin's dad at least. 
I personally have never gone back to the cabin, which really makes me sad, because I have some great childhood memories from there. Tommy and Kevin have both been back and been fine, but Ryan refuses to ever set foot there again, and I'm with him. A lot of people have cabins on that island, so it could have been a prank in the making, and Ryan busted it when he saw the person in the window. It could also have been a person wanting to do something worse to us. I'll never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that that incident, along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan, all happened in the same night, seems like more than a coincidence to me. I was out hiking in Morgan Monroe State Forest with my girlfriend one afternoon. It was a nice day, and the insects and birds were chirping away. Out of nowhere, the pair of us heard what sounded like three gunshots, one after another. They went off not too far down the trail. We looked at each other. A few seconds of silence. Then another three shots. Is that gunfire? My girlfriend asked me. I nodded, unable to think what else it could be out here. We decided to turn back, not wanting to chance running into some hillbilly nutjob or whatever. What struck me at that moment was the lack of any kind of sound coming from the woods. After the shots rang out, there wasn't any kind of nature sound at all. I mean, I get that the birds might have been scared away, but even the insects had fallen silent. We were both getting some weird vibes. The situation just felt unnatural. In amongst all the surreal silence, we heard one thing just behind us. Footsteps snapping on twigs. We turned to see who was following us. I half expected to see a hunter with a rifle. I was wrong. Moving down the trail towards us was this thing. A humanoid figure that obviously wasn't human. It was like looking at a living silhouette. Even in the light, it looked like it was hiding in the darkness. The thing just looked like a shadow. That's the best way I can describe it. The sunlight just wasn't hitting it for some reason. From its outline, it looked to just be skin and bones. And it was tall. Real tall. At least a foot larger than me, and I'm not a small dude. I'd scarcely believe I'd even seen the thing had my girlfriend not been there as well. It was walking in long strides, gaining a lot of distance with each step. Needless to say, we bolted back the way we came. I've no idea if that thing pursued us or not. We were both too terrified to turn back and look. We made it back to our vehicle and hightailed it home, not stopping for anything. We've never been back to Morgan Monroe since. Unless the both of us momentarily lost our minds at the exact same time, then there's something out in those woods, and neither of us plan on going back to find out what it is. So, near where I live, but a little farther out in the sticks, there's a glorified gravel path in the woods called Rube Hill. It runs maybe three miles long, and only half a mile of it's paved. On the south end is the pavement, with a few old but otherwise normal houses dotted around it. Deceptively average at that point. Then the houses end, the pavement ends, and the gravel road shoots up a steep hill. It's not taken care of at all. The gravel's piled up in potholes and berms, so unless you're driving a nice off-road vehicle, you'd want to take it easy. Since you'd need to drive slowly, you'd get a nice view of the handmade signs nailed to trees with messages like no trespassing, and we're watching you, scrawled in sharpie. At the top of the hill, the road winds lazily for a little under a mile before diving back down the other side of the hill. The gravel is in equally crappy condition on this side. After you reach the bottom of the hill, the road cuts straight for about a mile through cornfields before intersecting with another road. The reason I'm so familiar with the layout is that I've taken friends out on late night drives along this road to scare the bejesus out of them. Never an elaborate prank, I'd just drive slowly and play creepy music to get them amped up and paranoid. I always made sure to tell them about the meth heads and their labs out there, and how the sheriffs try to avoid going there because it's dangerous. I figured it was all hogwash, just stories, you know. But now I think there's an element of truth to some of those rumours. 
I was with my friend Aaron one night, and we decided to go on a late night drive along Rube Hill to freak ourselves out. We took off, drove down the various country highways and backroads, and turned onto Rube Hill. I made sure to play extra creepy music, since Aaron and I had made the trip many times before. It honestly lost a lot of its creepy luster on me, but I still enjoyed the long drives and scaring my friends. Of course, the drive mostly went by uneventful, and we were almost across the hill, about to descend the other side. That's when Aaron started freaking out. I checked my mirrors to see what had spooked him so much, and saw truck headlights down the road behind us. They seemed to be back where the road first topped the hill. The truck made it under the only street light on the top of the hill, a really dim orange light, and I could see it was kicking up a ton of dirt. It was speeding towards us. I paused the music we were playing, and sure enough, with the windows down, I could hear the gravel crunching and flying like the vehicle was speeding. Keep in mind that I've driven this road dozens of times, both during the day and at night, and not once have I ever encountered another vehicle. So, having a truck speeding to seemingly catch up to us at midnight on a road supposedly filled with rumoured junkheads was pretty jarring. Usually, I don't relinquish my brakes driving down that hill. This time, I didn't even touch them. Thankfully, we got home safe and sound. The next day, I'm hanging out with one of my other friends, Chris. Chris and I are lounging around, playing video games, talking about quantum physics, Chris's favourite thing, and Chipotle, my favourite thing. I of course told him about Aaron and I being chased, and I kind of hammed it up, made it come across more harrowing than it really was. Now Chris wanted to go to the road, so we waited until late at night, about 2am, and drove out to Rube Hill. This time I wasn't playing any music. I wanted to be alert. It was all going quite normally, just like usual, when I slammed on my brakes. I threw the car in park and turned to Chris. Oh, dude, you can see that too, right? Chris was just as confused as me. He looked at me and nodded. My headlights were clearly illuminating a thick metal cable stretched across the road in front of us. On the right, it was wrapped around a tree at roughly head height for an adult, and it was pulled taut across the road, anchored to a fence post on the left at roughly chest height. We were both sitting there, wondering what to make of it, when we heard gravel being thrown by tyres behind us. I checked my mirrors, and sure enough, truck headlights were tearing ass down the road. I started freaking out. My breathing and heart rate were out of control, and I began sweating. Chris just swore quietly under his breath. I threw it into drive, pulled as far to the right as I could, and my low-sitting car slid under the cable with a loud metal-on-metal -metal scraping noise. I cringed as I heard the scrape, but I wasn't about to sit there and get deliveranced. So again, I flew down the hill. And this is the creepy cherry on the Sunday for me personally, because Chris didn't see it. As we left the tree line and entered the cornfields, I glanced to my right, past Chris, and briefly caught a glimpse of somebody standing about three or four feet back in the corn. I just felt my stomach scrunch up, and I floored the accelerator. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could see a man standing in the road behind us, illuminated by the moon and my taillights. He had a long object slung over his shoulder. I couldn't tell if it was a cane or maybe a rifle, but I didn't stay to find out. Before I could even tell Chris about it, we were around a bend and out of sight. That car had a scrape mark on the roof the rest of the time I owned it. It was a good reminder of why I never went out to that road again. I used to live in a pretty old house in Wichita. A lot of strange happenings went on there, and I'm not sure if they're related to this incident or not. Sometimes, especially at night, we'd hear what sounded like static voices whispering down the hallway, creaking footsteps in the rooms above us, and see brief shadowy outlines of people moving in the corners of our eyes. We chalked it up to the house just being old, and our paranoid brains making us see things that weren't really there. In said house, there was a spare bedroom in the attic that we never really used. 
My wife and I didn't have any kids, still don't, and we never had any guests who needed to come and spend the night, so the room remained mostly empty. We didn't have much stuff at the time, so we didn't need to store anything up there either. My wife always talked about turning the space into a little hobby room. Now that might sound like a good decision to most of you, but I personally was against that idea. You see, the attic always had a weird effect on me. I never liked to go up there. Every time I did, I'd get these weird, electric sensations, like the air around me was static, if that makes sense. It's hard to properly articulate, but there was something really off about the whole space, and I'd get uncomfortable just being up there. There was a small crawl space at the bottom of the leftmost wall, and that crawl space always freaked me out in particular. It was only a small hole that went back into the wall, barely enough space for a human to squeeze into it, but whenever I'd go near it, the strange static sensations would intensify. Just looking at the thing gave me a headache. My wife, on the other hand, never noticed anything strange about the attic, and unfortunately for me, in this relationship, what she says goes, so I guess I was going to have to turn it into a hobby room. One night, I went up into the attic alone to start clearing some things out of it, get it ready for the transformation, so to speak. The air up there felt static and unsettling as always. It was past sundown by that point, so the one small roof window wasn't letting in any light. I flicked the light switch, and, for a brief moment, the room illuminated. It stayed light just long enough for me to get fully up into the room. Then, the light bulb started to dim. I mean, the brightness of the light just became lesser and lesser, to the point where I couldn't see anything at all. After a few seconds, the bulb went completely out. Ah, damn. Gonna have to replace that, I thought. That could wait. I clambered back down the ladder, back down from the darkness of the attic, rummaged through a drawer in my bedroom and pulled out a flashlight. I climbed back up into the blackness and switched the device on. Bright light came shining out of it. Then, the strangest thing happened. After maybe two or three seconds of being on full beam, the flashlight too began to fade. Its light became dimmer and dimmer, and within a matter of seconds, the batteries had completely run out of juice. That was a strange coincidence, but nothing more than that, I thought. Back down the ladder I scampered. I rummaged through my drawers again, and pulled out four fresh batteries. I reloaded the flashlight with two of them, and stuck the other two in my pocket. I climbed back up into the attic. Blick. I switched on the flashlight again, and again it lit up the room in front of me in a cone of light. After maybe two or three seconds, that light started to get weaker. After ten seconds, the flashlight was dead again, leaving me in total darkness. Now, up in the attic all by myself, completely blind, I became more aware of that oppressive, electrical quality. I quickly fumbled with the bottom of the flashlight, unscrewing it until it finally came loose. The two batteries inside fell out onto my hand. God damn, they were boiling hot, to the point where they actually felt like small blocks of fire on my palm. I dropped them instantly, and began stuffing in the other two batteries I'd brought along. I managed to get them in without too much hassle, and flipped the switch on the device once again. Out poured the light, and I did a quick 360 to check my surroundings. I soon calmed myself down, seeing that everything was as it should be, and shone my flashlight at the ground where the two hot batteries had fallen. They were lying right next to the crawl space. The static sensation became more noticeable as I bent down to pick them up. And, lo and behold, the damn flashlight in my hand began to lose power once again. That was it, I thought. I was just going to scoop up the fried batteries if they weren't too hot, and get the hell down from there. As I got to the ground, the light from my flashlight was at about half strength. Now, at eye level with the crawl space, the electricity in the air felt stronger than it ever had before. A strange compulsion took me, and I turned to look into the crawl space, and shone the fading light of my torch into it. Staring back at me were two black eyes. I only caught sight of whatever it was for a moment, but it was human-shaped, and lying on its stomach, twitching, with long, black hair running down the sides of its chalk-white base. 
It looked both human and non-human at the same time. It wore no clothes, but I couldn't tell you if it was male or female. Terror and disgust hit me all at once as my flashlight ran out of power again, leaving me once again in darkness, only this time with this thing right next to me. I jumped up and hurried back down the ladder, back out of the attic. Above me, I could hear it moving, first from what sounded like within the walls of the attic, and then from what sounded like the roof. That didn't make any sense. The crawl space didn't lead to the roof. Soon, the noises were gone. I ran downstairs to tell my wife we needed to leave at once. She looked at me in total confusion. She hadn't heard a damn thing. I explained to her as best I could, told her what I'd seen in the crawl space. She just laughed at me, told me I'd just seen a rat. That thing was no rat. After that incident, I never had the same strange static feeling when I went into the attic. The electricity in the air that I'd noticed for so long disappeared overnight. All the weird happenings around my home stopped as well. There were no more weird noises, no unusual shadows or creaks, and that crawl space, it returned to just being a regular hole in the wall. Nothing strange or unexplainable happened for the rest of the time I lived in that house. Maybe the whole incident was simply a brain spasm. You know, I could accept that. Maybe I just lost my mind for a few minutes. Sure, it's possible. But I know my wife's suggestion that it was just an animal is complete baloney. I may have only looked at the thing for a second or two, but I'll never forget what it looked like. It was damn near human. I have no idea what the static quality in the air was, nor why I was the only person who ever noticed it. But whatever that creature was in the crawl space, it took the static with it when it left. I live in a rural part of Colorado, on a farm close to the infamous Riverdale Road. A lot of strange goings on along that road, let me tell you. People have claimed to have seen all kinds of apparitions while traveling down it. One part of the road even leads off to a mansion that was once the headquarters of a satanic cult. Some folks say that the gates to hell are located there by the chicken coop, but that doesn't really have anything to do with this story. At least, I hope it doesn't. I must have been 14 years old at the time, doing some schoolwork at home, when, all of a sudden, my brother came running in, hollering, said that a mangy dog had wandered onto our property. My dad and I went out to take a look with him. Lo and behold, there was a humongous Doberman standing about 20 yards from our house, completely motionless. It didn't look healthy at all. Dobermans are almost always black, with patches of brown. This one was off-color, gray, and covered in blisters. It looked as if it was decomposing, despite still being alive, if only barely. Its eyes, they weren't like alive creatures. They were stark white, like it was blind or something. No pupils or color at all. It was panting heavily, and just looked at us, begging to be put out of its misery. We had no idea where it could have come from. There wasn't another house near ours for as far as the eye could see. And of the houses that were nearby, well, none of them had a Doberman. My dad didn't want the thing to suffer, and he certainly didn't want it spreading disease to our livestock. So he got his rifle and told us to go back inside. We knew what he meant. We went back and switched on the TV. No more than a few seconds later, we heard a shot ring out from the outside. My dad then dug a grave and buried the poor creature in a patch of unused land away from our house. That night, we all woke up to the sound of aggressive barking from outside. That was odd. We got up to check what it was. Outside our house was another Doberman looking identical to the one that had wandered onto our property in the day. This one, too, was diseased-looking, missing half its fur and covered in lumps. Where were these dogs coming from? Like the one before, this one was just standing motionless, waiting in the exact same place. What were different this time, though, 
were the eyes. They were still stark white, but they weren't like before. They were shiny, the color of the moon, like they were glowing. They stood out against the darkness of the night. Where are you poor creatures coming from? My dad asked it, rhetorically. Look away, boys, he said. We ignored his command. After staring at the beast for a few moments, my dad raised his rifle again and fired at the animal's head. It collapsed to the ground. Uh, get back to bed, he told us. We did as he said this time, but couldn't get much sleep. Dad went to dig another grave beside the one that he'd made earlier. But that's the thing. The grave he'd dug for the other dog was empty. It had been dug out from the inside. The dog he'd just shot, it was the same dog as before. He placed the strange animal back in the empty hole, filled it back up with earth, and retired to bed. We all put it down to the creature's will to live. Next morning, when we all woke up, we went to check on the grave. The damn thing was empty, dug out from the inside again, tracks leading off to the woodland near our house. After that, we never saw the dog again, though to this day, about once every three months, we hear that same barking coming from the woods near our house. Occasionally when we do, we'll look outside the window and see one of our farm animals standing in the exact same place that dog stood, just watching us, waiting for the gun. Sometimes it's a pig, sometimes just a hen, but no matter what, they always look decomposed. They never move, and at night, they all have those bright, moonlike eyes. Had to put down at least a dozen of them over the years. I don't know what that dog brought to our farm, but it ain't going away. I live on the outskirts of Sapporo in Hokkaido, Japan. It's an extraordinarily safe place to live, albeit a little freezing cold. This story just so happened to take place during a particularly cold winter there. The whole area was covered in snow, and the sun was beginning to set. I was power walking along the Ishikari River, desperately trying to get home. Even after living here for the past ten years, I still haven't gotten used to that damn cold. As I made my way along the riverside, I noticed a man up ahead, standing with his back to me. He had his hood up over his head, and despite all the snow, he was barefoot. I scanned the area, and there was absolutely nobody else around. Now, as I mentioned, I lived in an extremely safe part of the world, but even still, I felt a little uneasy. There was just a weird atmosphere about the guy. The way he was standing completely still, with his back turned to me. Well, he obviously wasn't looking at the river. Was he just standing there, staring at the ground? Not to mention, I'm a five foot two, petite woman, and this guy appeared to be at least six foot, very tall by Japanese standards. Still, I put all those worries to the back of my mind. The man remained perfectly still as I came to pass him. I muttered a quiet, good evening, under my breath, in a vain attempt to ease my unease, I suppose. He didn't reply as I walked past. All I could hear were the sounds of my footsteps, rhythmic and predictable. After ten or fifteen steps, though, something interrupted the flow of their beat. I turned around and saw that the barefoot man was following behind me now. But his face, the best way I can describe it, is like a mannequin or one of those wooden figures that artists use. Don't get me wrong, his face was fleshy, but there were no features. His head was faceless, just like an operabo from Japanese folklore. As I picked up my pace, he did as well. Now, extremely frightened, I broke out into a sprint, desperate to get away from the faceless man. Looking back over my shoulder, I could see that the man was running at full speed as well, no longer just keeping pace, but actually gaining on me. I'd never felt such fear in my life. 
I managed to make it to a corner with a bridge. From it, passing cars could see me. If this was the end, there'd at least be witnesses. I turned around one final time to see how close the man was to me now. But that's the thing. He was just standing there, frozen in place once again. He stood, facing me, if you want to call it that, and remained motionless as I fled into the distance. I ran all the way back to my home, unsure of what to do. Should I call the police? What should I tell them? That I saw a noperabo? As the night went on, I continued to deliberate. By midnight, I decided to sleep on it. I fell into a deep slumber, exhausted by the events of the evening. I was awoken by a series of loud, melodic notes. It was my front doorbell. I rubbed my eyes and checked the clock next to my bed. 3 a.m. What the hell? To say I was surprised would be an understatement. I have an app on my phone with a camera that's linked to my doorbell. That way, I can see who's standing at my front door without ever having to get up and check. I opened the app to see who in God's name was ringing my doorbell at 3 in the morning. The live footage from the camera popped up. Standing at my front door, with his head close up to the camera, was that same faceless figure I had seen by the river. It had somehow followed me. I dropped my phone in a state of pure shock. In a panic, I immediately ran into my bathroom and locked the door. My mind was racing, and I knew I had to call somebody for help. The police, my parents, my friends or my neighbours, I didn't care. Just anybody who could make this faceless man disappear. Stupidly, I had left my phone on my bed after I dropped it, but I was far too scared to leave the safety of my locked en suite. After 20 minutes, I finally worked up the courage to go and get it. I lifted my device, and, with my eyes half covered by my hands, reopened the app to see if he was still standing in my doorway. The live feed popped up again. The faceless man was nowhere to be seen. I took the opportunity to call my father. I told him some strange man had stalked me to my house, that he had come for me in the night. Needless to say, he rushed over, and arrived only a few moments before a police car. He had taken the liberty of calling them for me. I explained the situation to them all, told them about bumping into a faceless man by the river. I showed them my app, which confirmed my doorbell had indeed been activated at three in the morning. Frustratingly, the app didn't have a record function, so I had no definitive evidence to show them. Okay, said one of the cops. Be on the lookout for a man with no face. Got it. I thought he was mocking me, so I insisted I was being serious. Oh, believe me, I'm taking this seriously, ma'am, he said. You're not the first one around here to report this guy. As of right now, Nothing's come of their investigation. I don't know how many people in my town have claimed to have seen this guy, but from what the cop said, I at least know I'm not the only one. There's one final detail I have to share. When the police searched the area, they found a set of footprints in the snow, mud and grass around my house. They led from my front doorstep all the way around the perimeter of my house. Whoever had left them had stopped outside every one of my ground floor windows. The prints had obviously been made by somebody walking barefoot. No DNA could be extracted from them. I live in a remote, rural part of East Oklahoma. Nothing but farmland, wide empty fields or forests all around, depending on which direction you're looking. The nearest town is a solid 10 minute drive away from here, and before that, there's barely any signs of life at all. Oftentimes, I feel a little isolated here, especially since I live by myself. I arrived home from town one evening, just before sunset. It had been a long day at work, and to be honest, 
I was exhausted. I fed my little dog Curly, a Jack Russell Terrier, and then set about fixing up some dinner for myself. After that, I eased myself down into my armchair and flicked on the TV, put on some mindless show to zone out to. Ah, just what the doctor ordered, I thought. A nice, relaxing evening. As I watched TV, my eyelids became heavier and heavier. At some point, I drifted off to sleep. I woke up in my armchair a couple of hours later to the sound of Curly barking. Damn dog, I said, frustrated. Oh, shut up, would you? With that, Curly obediently fell silent. Good boy. It was pitch black outside now. The TV was the only thing lighting the room. Oh, I felt groggy and dazed, the way one does when they're suddenly woken up mid-nap. I stood up and made my way towards the kitchen to get a glass of water. I walked through to the hallway. Like I said, I was in a tired frame of mind, which is probably why it took me a moment to process that my front door was wide open. I always leave my front door locked. Living alone in the sticks can make a guy paranoid, and I never take any chances. My first thought was that some animal had wandered into my house while I slept, but that of course didn't make any sense. As far as I knew, there weren't any animals in this part of the country that could unlock a door. My thoughts went to Curly. He never usually barked for no reason. Confused, I walked back into the living room. There, hiding under the coffee table, was Curly. I'd never seen him like this before. He was looking directly into the dark dining room ahead of him, staring at something with surgical focus, absolutely transfixed. Had he not been shaking, you'd have probably thought he was a small statue. He knew something I didn't. Namely, what was in the dining room. All I could see through the doorway was darkness. The sound of a commercial played in the background from my TV. I inched closer to the dining room entrance, and Curly began to squeak, as if to warn me not to go in. I must have only been about six or seven steps from the doorway when I heard creaking from my dining room floorboards. My throat began to feel tight as the reality of the situation dawned on me. Then, through the blackness of the entrance, a huge, hunched-over figure stepped out towards me. It walked through into the living room and stood up in front of me. It was the tallest man I had ever seen in my life. He must have been seven feet tall, and he looked to be well-dressed. His upper body was immensely broad, but his lower body and limbs were long and stick-thin, like an emaciated skeleton. Its head. I wanted to vomit when I looked at it. It was far too small for its huge body, half the size of a normal human head. The light from my TV lit up its face. I thought I was going to pass out, but I couldn't help but stare at it. The best way I can describe it was like the face of a porcelain doll. Its skin was extremely pale and had absolutely no blemishes or markings, with a sheen like it was made of china. The shape of a human face was there, but the features were like a child's and looked as if they had been painted on. It was like a giant living doll. The expression remained frozen on its face as it just stood there, looking down at me six steps away from me. Hell, maybe only three steps for him. We just stood, looking at each other for what could have been five seconds or five minutes. Curly was going wild. It was surreal. That's when it let out the most disturbing, distorted wail I have ever heard. The tall man then stepped awkwardly towards me, the expression on its baby face unchanged. I ran to escape it, but it pushed past me and made for the front door. It ran out of my house, its thin legs struggling to hold up its body. I dashed upstairs to get my rifle, terrified it might return. I checked it was loaded, and then looked out my bedroom window. 
I watched from my window as the man-thing sprinted from my house. It leapt over the fence separating my property from the field next door and began running through the empty plains. It was a dark night, but there was just enough moonlight for me to make out one final disturbing detail. Without stopping, it twisted its head around until it was on backwards, so those soulless, empty doll eyes could look back at me as it ran away. My stomach almost hit the floor. It kept its porcelain face turned towards me as it faded into the tree line at the end of the field. I knew I should call somebody and tell them what just happened, but who? Hello, police. A huge, doll man thing just broke into my home and he took nothing. You know, what could I say? I confided in friends and family, who, guess what, told me I was going nuts. Hence why I'm sharing my story here. I wanted to get this off my chest, share it with people who might actually have something more constructive to say about my experience. People who won't just call me mad. I've done some research, and it seems like there have been some similar sightings in Hawaii. I don't think I can be alone in my experience. If anyone else knows what these things are, or has any other information to share, please let me know. I was having a drunken heart to heart with my dad the other night, and we were sharing some stories from the past. He told me an experience he had back in the late 1980s, which he described as the luckiest escape of his life. After hearing the story, I'm inclined to agree. He was about 25 years old, and going through a rough patch in his life. Him and my future mum had just broken up. They would later get back together, but that's a different story. Anyway, he needed to get away for a while. As such, he decided to rent out a cabin for the weekend. Just him, the birdsong, and a few beers. He booked one in this really remote, wooded area. He goes and collects the keys from the cabin's owner, a really nice guy in his thirties. Friendly, helpful, no trouble whatsoever. He gives him a quick tour of all the rooms, asks if there's anything more he can do, and then leaves my dad to it. My dad spends his first day there, relaxing and recharging, enjoying the beautiful scenery and trying to take his mind off his crummy situation. On that first evening there, he heads out on a long walk through the nearby woods. He wants to clear his head outside before the sun sets. He gets a little bit lost, however. By the time he gets back to the cabin, it's already dark. He enters the cabin, and immediately, something strikes him as weird. The curtains at the back of the cabin were drawn closed. Strange, he didn't remember closing them before he went out on the walk. Then again, his head was all over the place that weekend. Hello? He calls out. No response. Shaking it off as a mistaken memory, he walks into the bedroom to go to sleep. Again, something seems off inside. It wasn't the curtains again. There weren't any windows in the bedroom area. He says there was just a strange atmosphere in the room. He felt tense and ill at ease. Something in the back of his mind, in his subconscious, told him that there was a threat nearby. He grabbed his car keys and jacket, walked out the front door, got into his car and drove to a hotel. For whatever reason, he refused to stay in that cabin. At the end of the weekend, he returns to the cabin at around 4pm to drop the keys back to the owner. To his surprise, the owner's already there, along with several police officers. They're all astonished to see my dad. You see, the cabin's owner had come by a little earlier than he and my dad had agreed to collect the keys. Obviously, my dad wasn't there, so the owner had a look around the cabin to check that everything was alright. On the couch in the living room, there was a large, muddy shovel. That was a little weird, he thought. Then, he entered the bedroom. Inside, he found several Polaroid pictures laid out neatly on the bed. They were of my dad taken at various points throughout the day. One of him drinking a beer outside, one of him looking out the window, one was even of the cabin owner handing him the keys. 
they had all been taken from within the tree line. On the back of the last picture, someone had left a handwritten message. So close. Realizing that someone had been stalking my dad from the very beginning of his trip, and that my dad was now missing, the owner immediately called the police. When they arrived, they scoured the woods in search of my dad. Not too deep in, they found a freshly dug hole, four foot deep, seven foot in length. My dad arrived an hour later. The brain's a funny thing. Sometimes the subconscious takes in information that we aren't fully aware of. Perhaps something else was slightly out of place in the bedroom, or just different to how we left it. Whatever the case, the warning signals went off, and he listened. If this story has taught me anything, it's to always listen to my gut. Instinct probably saved my dad's life that night. This didn't just happen to me, but my friends, Macy, Eric, and Dorian too, while we were all out on a trip in northwest Montana. Macy's parents had a cottage out by Flathead Lake. One weekend, we all decided to head over there and do a spot of fishing. In this digital age, it's very easy to lose touch with nature. Personally, I was starting to feel like a caged animal that summer, trapped indoors with no reason to go outside. Oh, no reason other than my crappy part-time job. I guess we all just wanted to reconnect with the great outdoors. They say that when you're around old friends, you act the same age that you were when you met them. That was definitely true for us. We were a bunch of 19-year-olds, goofing around like we'd just hit puberty. Some things never change. We get to the cabin, and it's absolutely beautiful. A serene little log cabin, far out in the middle of nowhere. It was nice to get away from the bustle of our town. I mean, the cabin still had internet and everything, so it's not like we were totally living off the grid. But for us, this was going to be a taste of what it felt like to be a real outdoorsman. We all unpack and get to fishing as planned. Not many bites that day, sadly. Dorian wandered off by himself, looking for a better fishing spot. When he finally came back a while later, he seemed a little agitated. He told us that while out fishing a ways away, he heard what he thought was rustling in the tree line to his right. A little concerned about what it might be, he kept an eye on the area. Most of his attention was still focused on his rod in the water, when he heard what he thought was a bell ringing from the same spot in the trees. He swore that he saw a figure watching him from the bushes. Not that he could make out many features, he was still a fair distance away, but it looked like he was wearing a hoodie and crouching. That's when he grabbed his gear and hightailed it back to us. This put us all on edge. The closest cabin to ours was far, far away. We weren't expecting to see another soul this whole weekend. Still, it was probably nothing. We called it a day and headed back to the cabin early. We ate dinner and joked around until sunset, though we all kept occasionally glancing out the window. None of us said what we were looking for, but it was obvious that Dorian's story had made us all a little paranoid. Being the dumb kids we were at heart though, we decided to stick around for the night. When you're deep in nature, the nights are particularly dark. No light pollution. Looking out the window was like looking into the abyss unless you pressed your face right up to the glass. Then you could just about make out the outlines of the trees that surrounded us. To us, the slight fear we were all feeling was kind of fun. You know when you're with your buddies and you get spooked by something, but for whatever reason, you all kind of stick around and try to spook each other as well. Well, it was kind of like that. If any of us were by ourselves, we'd have been freaking out, but since we were all together, it was a sort of mini rush. Eventually, it starts getting late and we hit the hay. We're all sleeping in separate areas of the cabin. I'm in the living space on the couch. I'm exhausted from the long day, and the sound of the wind outside is sending me off to sleep. I'm almost out cold, when I hear the distinct sound of a bell ringing. It was coming from just outside the front of the cabin. It sounds off once, 
and then again, and again, sometimes quick and loud, sometimes slow and faint. I'm sitting upright in a heartbeat, and I don't have to call for my friends. They're all congregating in the living space now, keeping their voices low. It's the guy from the bushes, Dorian whispered to us all. He's outside the cabin. Pressing my eyes close to the window, I could see that he wasn't wrong. Out in front of the cabin, facing us, was a figure in a goddamn rocking chair. He was sitting stiff, rocking back and forth in the breeze. We have no idea how to react. After a while of watching in fear, Macy, the bravest of the group, opens up the window and shouts to the guy to go away, that his prank wasn't funny. The guy in the chair doesn't react, and just sits there, rocking gently, the sound of the bell ringing out. We grab a few knives and cautiously walk out the front door of the cabin, staying in a tight group. I was just following Macy at this point, to be honest, hoping that he knew what he was doing. Get out of here, Macy shouts, as we slowly get closer to the guy. Again, he doesn't react, and for good reason. The guy in the chair isn't alive. It's an old, dead man. We panic. Eric made a break for the tree line before coming to his senses and running back to the cabin with the rest of us. We locked the door and made sure all of the windows were sealed tight. Then we called the authorities. It took what felt like a lifetime for them to finally find us. They were just as weirded out by the dead old man as we were. Examining him in greater detail, they said that whoever he was, he'd been dead for a long time. They could tell from the decomposition. He was most likely disinterred from his grave. Namely, some sicko had dug this poor guy up and put him in that damn rocking chair. Whoever had done this had also tied a small bell around the man's neck, which rang out as the chair rocked back and forth. A very light set of footprints could be made out in the dirt, leading up to the chair from the tree line. The authorities couldn't find a set leading back though, so God knows what direction the perpetrator walked off in. To our knowledge, the investigation never came to anything. Whoever was watching Dorian from the woods that day remains at large. Why they dug up the old man and used him to terrorize us, I have no idea.